I'm Sean Fennessy. I'm Amanda Dobbins. And this is the Big Picture, a conversation show about everything but movies. Amanda is headed out on leave soon, so we're banking episodes. I had an idea. What if we just had a whole episode that didn't talk about movies? That's probably not actually going to happen here. because Yeah, people didn't obey the rules, no, right, Bobby? No. You, I tried. Bobby, you I, left I the, chastised you left the, them. I did. You left the window open, though. You were like, oh, but maybe you could. And then everyone was like, tell me about how to organize my Blu-rays. You know, they couldn't I mean, like, themselves. at the end of the day, am I right or wrong? This is a movie podcast. We do it still have some yeah. constrictions. We just... We're recording from the past for the future. And so we needed some sort of like news, you know, barrier, you know. Yeah. Something pl- unaffected by the world at large. Deniable deniability. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is what we came up with. And um I feel like we should just dive right in, right? There's no no reason to wait, no reason to clear our throats any further. Sure. Yeah. The first question is a very offensive question from our friend and colleague Jomi Adenaran. Jomi says, hey guys, first time, long time. Question for Sean and producer Bobby Wags. Who do you think should be the NL MVP? And why is it unequivocally and objectively Shohei Otani? Not sure why Jomi left you out here, Amanda, since you're Los Angeles' number one Dodgers fan. And and frankly, right now, big Phillies fan. So, you know, this is, again, I really hope I'm not jinxing things. I watched an absolutely pitiful, pitiful performance against the Brewers last night, which actually does matter. Hmm. More for you two. Than for the Phillies. Why is that? Because the Brewers are leading the Central League right now. That's right. And they have 86 wins, mm-hmm. but you need them to get losses so that you can get a wild card spot. That's not true. That doesn't matter. It doesn't? Does no. it? Isn't it top six? Uh, well, the three division winners are automatically in. So they're automatically going to be in. Now the, oh, I guess that's true. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. This is an incredible way to start off this episode about not the news. So right now, Shohei <laughs> is at 47 and 48, I believe. 47 home runs, 48 mm-hmm. stolen bases. I am tuning in every night. Mm-hmm. I solved the problem. I don't know whether it's legal or not, so I won't be saying how. But I want the regional sports networks to know that I still am against you. And it's a fucking outrage. But I am watching the Dodgers. I'm hopeful that we'll be at 50 and 50 by the time this goes out for Shohei. He's got 12 games left to hit three home runs. I think he can do it and steal two bases. Yeah. But there, everyone's kind of being mean about the stolen bases at this point. They're well, really thrown back to first. Uh, the, but the, I don't know. This is, I think Otani obviously is probably the greatest baseball player I've ever seen, mm-hmm. and short of Barry Bonds. And. Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not opposed to him winning MVP. The stolen bases part of the argument doesn't really mean anything to me, honestly. Like they changed the rules two years ago. It's way easier to steal bases than it was, uh, you know, for years and years when Ricky Henderson was stealing 75 bases a year, hitting 50 home runs and and having a 1100 OPS and being the heart and soul of the Dodgers' offense. Absolutely, sure, I get it. That's cool. Does the man play shortstop 160 games a year? He does not. So uh, to me. I'm willing to have the bravery to say, Shohei Otani, you're a fraud. Play shortstop, fraud. But Don't say that, because he probably will. He could and will, Good. if you tell him to. True. All right, so who are you nominating as National League MVP in well, Shohei's Well, place? naturally, Francisco Lindor is is in second place. That's the, right. like, that's the purpose of the question. That's the, he's, okay. he's trying, trying to, to set us trying off. To, he's trying to neg us. So I'm looking right now. You're looking at F4? No, no, no. I'm looking have at Have you the... got baseball reference open? No, 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 no. I just listen. I just have the things open. So <laughs> you guys have the sixth spot right now. Correct. Atlanta is one game behind you. That's right. And you're kind of dancing with the Diamondbacks and to a lesser extent, the Padres. Yes. I think the Padres are out of reach. The Mets have a very difficult schedule. It'll all be clear at this time when this episode mm-hmm. airs what has transpired. Including against three more or four more games against the Phillies. Four Another more series. with the Phillies, three more with the Braves. Okay. And three more with the Brewers. So they're in a tough spot. Yeah. Um, I am a doomer and do not think this is going to work out. I've earned that doomer status the hard way, having my heart get broken over and over again. Now, both Bobby and Jack Sanders, who works on this show, are also both diehard Mets fans. I promise we didn't like arrange this so that our producers would be diehard Mets fans, but they are. Mm -hmm. And they are not doobers. I would say Bobby is, as he gets older, he gets closer and closer Uh, to my perspective. You, you still let the hope in. And then 
and then you're crushed publicly. And and Jack, to his credit, has been steadfastly positive this entire season. And on this day, I think Jack, you still believe they're gonna they're they're gonna make the playoffs. There's no point in being a doomer. There's no point. I've done it too long. I'm only 23. It doesn't matter. I've done it since I was seven years old. No. The, Why the not be optimistic? No, it's a op- fun team. The opposite is true. I can't. I can't let deeper pain in. As I've Zende- let so much pain into my life. As Zendaya said in the film Spider Man: No Way Home, I think the Mets are going to go all the way this year. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you feel the same way. Uh, I feel like I'm a selective doomer. You know, I I allow myself to have hope, and then I tap out when it feels like that hope has been extinguished. So that I can go on living my life in an enjoyable way. Because I just, the truth is, I just get too close and it really actually genuinely affects my real life. And at that point, I just look at myself like from a 30,000 foot view and I'm like, is this, should I be doing this? The answer is no. And so I feel like I've extinguished some of those more doomer qualities where it just like ruins my whole week. You know, it might ruin my day from time to time, Amanda, you're right about that. But letting it ruin my whole week or month, I just, I feel like, I'm in a better place with that recently. I'd love for you to come to my house and preach that throughout the football season, which is another element here that's really difficult. So I renounced the Braves. I was forced to renounce the Braves. Thank you for your service. Like at City uh, Hall? Like, team. did you go down and get a document signed? <laughs> no, I just have to defensively yell, I renounce the Braves yeah. every time Zach or Chris Ryan like looks at me. Um, you guys, you guys are more accepting. Also, it's like I renounced the Braves for the Phillies, so you don't really care. Um, they both can die in a fire, as far as I'm concerned. But Completely agree. I'm really in on the Phillies right now, in part because my son loves the Philly fanatic, in part because I do like watching baseball, and it's also just like a really good thing to do when you're like too pregnant to move. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and also, hopefully, by the time you listen to this, when you're like home with a newborn, so. The Dodgers, you know, the Phillies usually play at four and then the Dodgers at seven. So it's like a great just have something on. I really need one of them to stick around for October. And like, I'm going to be honest, they're both kind of fucking up right now. So I do understand where you guys are are. are in decent shape. The Dodgers are not in such good shape. The genius of this opening the episode with this question is the plan is for this episode to air on October 25th. And day one of the World Series right. is October 25th. Okay. That's the first game, according to the schedule. So, do you think mm-hmm. the Mets, Dodgers, or Phillies will be in the World Series? God, I hope so. I mean, if it's like the Brewers or the fucking... I feel like the Padres. The Diamondbacks the Padres kind again, of have the look right I, like, now. I can't. Yes, no me. one cares, respectfully. It's cl- classic coastal elitism right there. I mean, there. the Padres are San Diego. Yeah. You yeah. know? Lovely the town. I have are friends Arizona. Who the, Padres, the people of so Arizona the have a lot to answer for, in my opinion. So, um... The people of Arizona? Yeah. Like who? Like Carrie Lake? <laughs> to name one. Okay. All right, fair enough. You think she's a big D-backs fan? Super into Zach Gallen? That really okay. cha- that was really challenging for Chris last year when the Diamondbacks eliminated the Phillies and those were his two loves competing. I know, I know. yeah. It's brutal. Okay, that's enough baseball. What's next? Does anyone know how the Philly Fanatic can come to my son's birthday party? Please get in touch if so. The Philly Fanatic used to come to my elementary school once a year, so he could come. He's available. Okay. There were some licensing issues, so it seems like he's like maybe not as available as he once was. This was like a years-long legal battle. Correct? Yeah, but I just like this. It's really, we're getting pretty desperate, so let me know. Dodgers Royals is my prediction, just to be on the record and from the past to the future. The next question comes from Amanda, another Amanda listening. As a newish listener, what's the Amanda Sean origin story? The big picture origin. What's the origin story? I'm really sad to say it's the uh, 2012 film, The Avengers. That's right. That's true. <laughs> it is probably the origin story for this podcast. So we met through my now husband, Zach Barron. Mm-hmm. I mean, we all were living in New York. Mm-hmm. We all worked for magazines in New York. And you were very close friends with Zach. So that's how I got to know you and Chris eventually. Then you guys moved, you and Chris moved to Los Angeles for Grantland, which was fortuitous timing for me because Zach was like, well, I don't have any friends anymore, so I guess I'll date you. Um, And now we hopefully have two children. Um, No, that's like, that's like The Phillies were right on a downswing too, so he didn't have that taken up his time. 
the, it, but it's like, I, I mean, that is like sort of a joke, but it really, that's how it happened. In New York, Chris and Zach and I did spend an inordinate amount of time together. Yeah. And a, lo- a lot of time together. But before you moved, we all attended a press screening of the film The Avengers. We did. And then we went to a bar that I think still exists, Flatbush Barn. Farms. Well, it's far. The farm was the restaurant, and the bar n- was the bar. Oh, really? Yeah. Don't you remember? You just there were the two. This to yeah, me. yeah, and okay. there was like the swinging the barn. Barn door. was like meant to be like a pun on bar barn. Yeah, that's a really terrible pun. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it was Flatbush Bar and okay. Flatbush ba- like barn was next door, and we were in the barn section. We were. We were. So I I didn't know you were there. We didn't like go together <laughs> no. or anything. A bunch of people went. Yes. Uh, did Zach go? I remember Andy I Greenwald think so. was there. Yes. Andy Greenwald was there. It was it was six sweaty dudes who'd just seen Joss Whedon's The Avengers I, I and mean, you. I think that was Willa there? Like who else was there? Maybe my friend Willa Paskin was there. Willa was there when Zach and I like officially, officially met for the very first time outside a press screening of the 2011 Anna Ferris film, What's Your Number? Yep. Also starring Chris. Uh, Evans, yep. aka Captain America. Uh, true story. That's that's where we met, and they were talking Re- re- recently enshrined in the National Registry, <laughs> you know, at the Smithsonian, yep. which is exciting. Um, but so press greetings were a big part of our early dating. Mm-hmm. So I think he probably just went because we were in the habit of going to movie screenings, and I was working at Vulture at the time, so yeah. that's why I went. We, so yeah, we hung out there. We'd hung out like once or twice, either before or after that. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know you very well at all. Um, and only got to know you more when I would come back to New York or when you guys would come visit us in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And then you came to work at the ringer. Correct. Um, And we moved out to LA. Yeah. And you came to run culture. Yeah. Um, on the site. And for the, as far as the show goes, like, I think I've told the story before how Bill was just like, you should just interview directors on this show. Right. Um, and at a certain point we decided to, and that was going fine. And then Bill was like, you need to make this, I don't know if you use the phrase a real podcast, but that's the <laughs> phrase that I, that I hear in my mind's eye. And, uh, it sounds like Bill. Yeah, have conversations and cover, I think in particular it was award the awards. Season. Yeah, yeah, award yeah. Season. I was doing, because that's always been the shared passion yes, of ours. We have always talked about that. And so I asked you to do it. We yeah. always uh, had great chemistry and I thought it would be funny. And I, I have said before, like, I really wanted somebody who was not like me mm-hmm. on the show. You know, like not didn't have the same taste as me, didn't have the same. But Listeners we had convergences. may not agree. Well, no, I, I mean, obviously it worked. Like I don't, I don't have. I certainly, yeah. Don't think that was the wrong idea at all. But um, that's pretty much it, right? Like, is there anything? Yeah. There's nothing else to it. And Bobby did not start for- out with us as as producer, but you joined maybe like a year in, a year and a half in. I actually joined right before Amanda joined. So, oh, okay, that was this fall that I got brought on full time at the Ringer. I was an intern right before that. I would think I would did a couple episodes of the interview show and then pretty quickly right away. Right. It became the conversation and, and show. And you as were well. in LA. And so you were also coming to a lot of screenings, which was a halcyon time for all of us. And then the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. And then the show changed forever. Well, I mean, it, I, I, what happened is this Frog Sheriff happened, the Deacons <laughs> Hall of Fame happened, and then the show changed. And I'm happy that it changed, but I. <laughs> I, I do have some misgivings about what it has become. <laughs> I have to be honest about that. I know that it, people like it. <laughs> this was not my life's goal to be a, a clown on a show that I host. But now that I am, I had to have to true. accept it. Yeah. yeah. it's If I meet anyone who listens to the show, I like I, I promise I'm not like that yeah, all the time. Yeah. Only, well, sometimes. Yeah, uh, yeah sometimes, I mean, yeah. you know. Uh, and yeah, we've been doing it all together for a long time now. It's been six plus years we've been doing it. That's crazy. That's right. Um, David asks, given that you guys started the podcast in 2017 or 2018 thereabout, do you find it challenging to come up with reasons like the movie draft to discuss some of your faves before 2017? I don't find it challenging. I think it's not as natural because the conceit of the show is kind right. of contemporary I mean, movies. There is another podcast in, on the Ringer Podcast Network that you frequently appear upon. Which show? Uh, sports Card Nonsense? Yeah, Sports Card Nonsense. Um, I, th- I think, honestly, it's more challenging to find. We re- we just did a podcast this week, I think, according to the spreadsheet, about a great movie called Anora. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
that was really fun because it was like, oh, I love this movie. So mm-hmm. it's it's honestly the the new movies that were like super jazzed about or sort of like instant classics are actually harder to come by, which is like the nature of movies. Yeah. I think so. It's funny you say that too, because this summer, as you know, I always try to keep a positive spirit about the state of movies. Sure. But, yeah. Um, Famously. <laughs> but I, I do, I do genuinely look for the good in movies, if not the movie right. industry and the state of the movie world. Um, And I think that this past summer was like, it was like an okay summer. We everything, had, every movie was three stars. You know what I mean? There yeah. were no movies where I was like, God, it's my favorite movie. So it's nice to be heading into a season now where a couple, I've now seen, you know, I saw, said this about Nickel Boys. We said it about Nora. A couple things where I'm like, wow, that is actually, I've not seen something like this before. I mean, and that is kind of always the way, which is, yeah, you, the, you know, the, the summer is the blockbuster dumb season, you know, smart dumb season. Yeah. And then, then all the prestige movies come out. To this question though, I have enjoyed, like, I enjoyed doing the Sydney Lumet episode. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed doing the Philip Seymour Hoffman episode. I think it would be nice if we just did that a little bit more frequently. Candidly, it's harder to make, it's harder, it's more time mm-hmm. to, to put into an episode like that, especially since we're twice a week, sometimes three times a week in the second half of the year. And Sometimes it's harder to get people to care, which I find a little bit frustrating, but I do understand why that's the case because people just want things that they know. They don't, in this format of podcasting, they don't want things that they don't know. Mm -hmm. They want to discover like a five-minute recommendation. They don't want a 90-minute recommendation. So it's complicated to know when to do it. For example, I really want to do the same thing we did for Lumet for Altman next year because he turns he would have turned 100 next February, I think. Oh, wow, but that's like... But that's a huge deal for me. Yeah. And... It's a lot of work. It's a lot Lot of of movies. A lot of movies. And how do you do it right? And there's multiple books about Altman. And, you know, it's thorny. It's complicated at times. Like, some of those movies are not even available. Yeah. Does it make sense to be devoting all the... I don't... You know, I want to do it. I want to do it. You should... You know what you should do, actually? You should do, like, a... Your own little scripted thing. That takes even more time. Yeah, but it's... It's October. It's not even October. It's September. I know you have to prepare some PowerPoint presentations, but after that, you can. I do. Don't I'll, mock me. I have a whole other job. <laughs> I'll, I'll edit it. I can do it. I can okay. help you. Okay. Well, you know? what, what if you wrote it and I edited it? No way. Okay. I'm, I'm I don't right. like Bill said. My fingers don't work anymore. Okay. All right. What's the next question, Bobby? Next question comes from Pizza Dad. If movies <laughs> cease to exist, what Ringer Pod are you two best suited to host? Is the question t- together? Like, are we hosting a show together or are we going on existing shows? I think open for interpretation. I mean, you both participate in other shows. So I I think think together. And so any question that we, any answer that we give here is by no means meant to besmirch the actual hosts of the podcast. Because I was about to say, like, I we could do our own version of Press Box. Oh, Yeah. But it would be, but like Brian Curtis and David Schumacher are amazing at that. There's so. nothing wrong with that show. Yeah, at all. no, yeah. it's it's wonderful. Yeah, but like that's an interest that you know we both have. I guess if movies don't exist, then rewatchables doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. I do already host a different podcast called Jam Session, which mm-hmm. I remain eminently qualified to host, <laughs> given that it's that Jam Session comes from Juliet and Amanda, um, and that's still my name. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Those were the only qualifications <laughs> needed. I also, don't think I knew that. What I'm, matters to Jam Session Island is decided by uh, a committee of two. That's right, and I'm one half. So, <laughs> um, though you know what, maybe you could be a, a guest on Jam Session while I'm out. Uh, Juliet is looking for guests. Uh, JMO session, perhaps. Yeah, there you go. I thought of it's not really a podcast, but I thought I of a, a short like maybe TikTok series that I could host mm-hmm. for The Ringer that I think I would honestly be amazing at. Okay. And this is also... Okay, so we recorded a draft that hasn't aired yet. But I had one of these classic moments where there was a question posed during the draft um, that I didn't have an answer to in the moment, but now I have a great answer to. And it's like, what job oh, do yeah. you think that you could substitute in for and do perfectly? Or do better than the person doing it. Mm-hmm. So I think that we should have a TikTok series where 
And it can ju- it can start with just NFL catches <laughs> um, and NFL <laughs> touchdowns. But you show me the video and I, using my eyes and common sense, will yeah. decide whether or not it's a catch You're or the not. sports decider. I am, I am the sports decider because you guys have <laughs> just lost the plot. <laughs> You know, like it is absolutely out of control. I understand that there are rules and you're reviewing the rules and you're changing the rules and we have all the replays and it's an insult to the people watching at home who can use their brain and Mm -hmm. decide whether that looks like a catch or whether that doesn't look like a catch or whether that looks like a touchdown. There would be like a 40 week, like, TikTok segment on pylons alone. I have so many thoughts about the pylons and why that counts. But, you know, we can start with the NFL. Then we can move to like NBA or, Mm -hmm. you know, any really any other decisions that need to be made. I, in 30 seconds, just with my brain, Mm -hmm. with this noggin, can make every decision that you need. And I feel like that would be amazing ringer content. Yeah. I'll, I'll call Roger Goodell. Okay. See what he thinks. Uh, I don't, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what ringer pod are See, we suited to host? That was free content. That pod doesn't exist. Yeah, that just, you just call pitched? me. I know, but just call me. I'm available. Um, I think they should make me the host of every single album. Taylor <laughs> Swift. The sad thing is, is that like, aside from Taylor Swift albums, you could do so many every single album yeah. podcasts. I th- Actually, I was thinking about finding a way to communicate this to the audience of this show. This is important <laughs> to me. Um, we always are like, this. we're not critics, right? We say that all the time about the yeah, pod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason why I say that is twofold. One, we're not performing an act of criticism because we're having a conversation. And that doesn't mean that we're not thinking about critical ideas, but I don't, I see what the act of criticism is very different yes. from me and you hanging out and talking about what we thought about something. Right. Uh, and the other thing is that I am a trained critic who literally went to school to learn about criticism mm-hmm. and ran music criticism sections of magazines for a decade. Right. Like, I deeply understand what it is to be a critic. And I assure you that this is not criticism, what we're doing on the show. Um, but that is, like, all tied up in the that kind of, like, spongy middle of, like, what is podcasting? Uh that is related to this question where you're like, yeah, I could do every single album, the Wu-Tang Clan. I could do every single album, the Eagles. I could do every single album, John Coltrane. Like, I I just spent 40 years of my life Mm -hmm. amassing all of this information. Would that just be an elevated expression of fandom? Or would it be criticism? Or neither. Would it just be like, I think it would yelling be yelling my feelings. Yeah, yelling your feelings, which we <laughs> used to do at bars, and now you do into a microphone and get paid for it, which frankly, good job. I know it worked out. Yeah. The culture came to me. Yeah. Well, I we always I always joke about that with Chris, where I'm like, the world had been Chris had been waiting for podcasting to be created for 37 years, and then it was created and it was like, holy shit, the greatest living <laughs> podcaster is sitting here, here the yeah. whole time. This is amazing how this worked out. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Um what ringer? I don't know. No, the press box is probably the right answer. I yeah. think that's a good call because you and I are. We could do it and we consume yeah. like different but related strains we of do. media. I had a fantastic time going on the pod, on press box with Brian Curtis. It's, so it's one of our best shows. Yeah. Um, he's wonderful. He's so again, best, we're yeah. not trying to replace him, yeah. but you know, it was fun. If I'd love to be asked back. Incredible, incredible answer. That's my answer for what show am I most qualified to produce besides this one is yeah. the press, press box. box. Yeah. yeah. I actually have a journalism degree in case anyone at home is wondering what are my qualifications here? I, I don't. I have no um, formal training except for, you know, knowing what a catch is. So sometimes that's enough. Yeah. You know? The trenches, trained by the trenches. Okay. Our next question here in this very serious journalistic endeavor is from Kush Jones. And Kush Thank Jones Kush. wants to know. Appreciate it, Kush. Dream JMO guest, dead or alive. Kush slash, Kush slash, Kush slash. Good. You guys remember that? Jerry Maguire? No. Um, Gore Vidal. That's a good one. The first person who came to my mind was Marion Cotillard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people think that JMO is about conspiracy <laughs> theories, but what about truth? You know, does she have the truth? Does she know the truth? I think that she has perspectives on a lot of important global events, uh-huh. you know, different ways of, um, of of making movies, a different ways of different lifestyle. You know, she's got it all. So 
I I think it would be funny. Also, she's on the morning show, season four. So you should get her on jam session. That's what you need to do. Yeah. I feel like she's just loose with her opinions. I mean, that is why I want her on JMO. Yeah. JMO, I don't know. JMO is not about guests, you know? It's not about like booking high level talents. It's about cutting through. I don't want your press tour talking points. Yeah. Get that out of here. I want people who've never made anything to come on JMO. Also, though, also, I kind of want Oliver Stone, right? Like, he is the original JMO. It's true that without him, there is no JMO. There's no denying that. That he is, he is sort of the Plymouth Rock of, of what we make at JMO, which I'm just prouder and prouder of every day. I can hardly believe (laughs) how big it's gotten and what a huge part of my life it is. Um, next question. Andy asks, fiction and nonfiction book recommendation. I don't read fiction anymore, as you know, but I am reading a nonfiction book not about movies at this exact moment. It was a gift given to me by my dad that is called The Snakehead by Patrick Radden Keefe, which I think is his first book of nonfiction. Oh, okay. Um, which is about a crime syndicate. Um related to illegal immigration and human trafficking that is entirely run by an 80-year-old Chinese woman. And it's a true story, obviously. It's a work of journalism. And it is fucking crazy. Uh, And I didn't know this book existed. And my dad read Say Nothing. And he was like, "Um, what do you know about this guy? And I was like, oh, yeah, I know all about him. He wrote a book about uh, Big Pharma. And he wrote about the Sacklers. Empire Pain, which uh, we also recommend. I mean, Patrick Radenkeefe is one of the I was like, he's like an incredible New Yorker book. And he was like, I read this other book that he wrote about, you know, the Chinese syndicate in in New York. And I was like, I don't know what that is, Dad. So shout out to my dad for putting me onto a great work of nonfiction. I I did not know about this book either. Uh, I believe the television adaptation of Say Nothing is coming out a few weeks after this podcast airs. If you haven't read Say Nothing, that is, that's just number one. Unbelievable. Um, I have several recommendations because I like to read. I am currently reading the new Rachel Kushner book, Creation Lake, uh, which I am enjoying. I think it's very good. What's it about? It, it's it's sort of a spy novel. Mm-hmm. It is about a woman who used to work uh, undercover for one of the American agencies and now has gone private. And she is investigating um, an eco-activist group in the southwest of France. Okay. But it's, that makes her sound, well, I don't know whether it makes her sound like, who's the good person and who's the bad person and where your alliance is and who's doing the right thing is uh, very much questioned throughout Ambiguity. the Ambiguity. Yeah, We love it, it as a, yeah. a literary this theme. Movie, this book was recently the subject of some, you know, you gotta love a good literary takedown in the London Review of Books, mm-hmm. but so it's sort of like, it was also shortlisted for the Booker Prize. So, you know, it's Rachel Kushner. I'm enjoying it. Just want to okay. say, I think it's good. Will it land the plane? I don't know. I'm not there yet. Uh, I will also shout out the new Kate Atkinson novel, Death at the Sign of the Rook. It's the latest in her Jackson Brody series. She's my favorite living novelist, probably. Uh, that just came out. So, and also Freeport Dimension. So that's good. And then I have two nonfiction books for you also. Shoot. Uh, number one is just my friend's book, Selling Sexy, Victoria's Secret, and The Unraveling of an American Icon by Lauren Sherman and Chantal um, Fernandez, which just came out and is also very good if you care about, I don't know, fashion or retail or business or... What if you care about lingerie? Sure. Okay. There you go. Do you? Are you passionate about lingerie? Uh, you've, have you, I'm sure that you've purchased something at Victoria's Secret certainly. in your life. Yeah. yeah. We all I'm have. a married man. Um, and then the other one is the... Uh, a, my comfort book, which is the Vanity Fair Diaries by Tina Brown, which came out several years ago. Um, I reread it because I couldn't sleep. But it's an amazing book about the 80s, about what boomers did to us, um, about magazines, about my hero, and also very readable. So I don't know. There you go. You you came prepared. I did. I I I like books. That's the that's other my pod physical. That you could that's do my is, physical you could do media. Yeah, but pod. no one listens to a podcast about books. Yeah, I do listen to more books now. I than do. Ever, I though. do actually listen to the New York Times Book Review podcast mm. now because Gilbert Cruz, the editor and our friend, our relaunched friend, it, yeah. and he has the most famous authors in the world on just hanging out. It's pretty cool. Are they good at potting? Yeah, some of them are. 
Who's the be- been the best so far? Uh, Jonathan Franzen. Thank you. Jonathan you Franzen should post? have a podcast. Do you remember the blog post that they did during the pandemic that was like all, the, this was a New York Magazine blog post and it was all these authors' bookshelves, which was like a good idea. And most people were like, you know, some people had the Billy and some people had, it was just like, what do you use to shelve your books? And then Jonathan Franzen just like sent construction instructions for the bookshelf that he handmade. Very special guy. He's elite. I think the culture has completely come back around to, oh, holy shit, a, a, the world-class novelist of our time. There was like a dip there for like five to 10 years. We were like, oh, he's so annoying. But then you go back and you read Freedom and you're like, motherfucker, these the corrections, these books are unreal. He's, he's, of, he's amazing. Lots of birds in Freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. We love birds and we okay. love to fly. What's the next question? And to be clear, you just don't care about fiction anymore, despite all that. Well, when the culture turned against Franz and I turned against fiction. That's just a fact. Uh, the next question comes from Zach. How would Sean and Amanda rate... This is not Zach Barron. I promise. How would Sean and this Amanda rate later. each other's general email etiquette? This is an amazing question. I have so many opinions about Sean's email et- etiquette. What's my email? Like, I don't even know what it is. Well, it's a little... It, it's like texting with you in that it's What's a that little like? Jekyll and Hyde, uh-huh. you know? And sometimes <laughs> you get the real... It's either like... So there's a there's a person that we all know and hate called Plain Sean. Um, and Plain Sean is a literal person who can be on a plane just like turbocharging through work and correspondence. And you suddenly get like 45 emails uh, and a lot of calendar invites and some loosey-goosey big picture ideas and like uh, pun intended, but also not. And also like some really specific plans about like, we should go to this mall on this day. You know, it's like, he's really, he's just locked in to the documents. And so plain Sean communicates very tersely um, and exclusively with severe punctuation. (laughs) And like the, the highest version of plain Sean does come from Sean on a plane, but it doesn't always have to be on a plane for you to get some plain Sean style correspondence. Mm-hmm. It's really at its core. It's downtime, Sean. Um, but but like it, but it's not downtime. It's like efficiency, Sean. Um, and you know, and I would group that in the category of the guy who doesn't want to say hi to you at the supermarket, um, even though you're one of his literal best friends. <laughs> but then sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes you do get downtime, Sean, Lucy Goosey, Sean, like let's, let's chat. Um, exclamation points are used then. Mm-hmm. You might get like a, a second or a third response. Mm-hmm. This is true on text and email. Sometimes you get like a forward with a joke and you're just like, wow, having a good day over there. <laughs> so, you know, I would say that email is still one of his most, I, like, top three forms of communication. I feel like some people have really, like, sunsetted email, but Sean is still dialed in. Um, uh-huh. the, the other thing is that, like, you can tell on timing, you either get an answer right away or you get an answer at, like, between 10 and 12 p.m. when he's, like, clearing and he's doing, like, his inbox zero thing. And that's a, that's going to be a more severe plain Sean experience. I feel like you're carrying over a lot of <laughs> like scar tissue from 2016 and 17. When no, I when but, I was at my yeah. most Tasmanian devil working phase of my life. You did, pre-pod. You did send like a really prompt and friendly email yesterday that I was like, what did it say? It was and it was like, hey, I already like saw this, but thanks so much. Thanks for listening, oh, like yeah. exclamation point. Yeah. And that's like a new muscle that you've developed that I'm proud of. No, it's just, that's how I talk to people that I respect. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just like a lot of like one sentence emails with a period at the end, you know, that still, <laughs> <laughs> and like you, like you all know what that means. Um, uh, so now it's your turn. I mean, what a remarkable expression of power I've developed. <laughs> I feel so good about what my reputation is. Um, I think I would describe Amanda's extended communication over both email and text as avoiding the point. (laughs) That there's no attempt 
to get to the final destination really at any point. And perhaps that resembles somewhat your participation on this show. That you, There are plenty of, that you are a very open correspondent that you want to talk. Yeah. You, you have a lot to say and you're curious what other people have to say about things. You want to have fun. You want to yeah. laugh. But you don't want to get the work done. And I, my... What work? Well, like, if, you're, if we're scheduling something, that's one email, mm-hmm. one text. Like, we've said it. It's all one pod. Okay. It's all, this is all part of a big I project. Have, I don't have time to, like, be constantly podcasting with you. But that's, that's not what yeah. I'm saying. Now, it would be... I think that would be funny. And perhaps the yeah. 24-hour telethon is in our future here to raise <laughs> some funds for a, a cause we care about. But more that... I'm trying to stay on the task of my life, Mm -hmm. which is, frankly, just grinded me to bits lately. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) so I try to, like, the terseness is an expression of that time is money thing that I feel inside me, that very Long Island aesthetic of, like, what are we actually doing here, folks? Yeah. You are not operating in that way. You are operating in a, like, did you see this hat? (laughs) I like this hat. And and I honestly, I'm not mocking you. I respect it. If I could get on your level, I would be sending hat texts and be like, this is, I liked this. This was cool. But I don't, I, you know, and the, 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 the precious few things that I have that energy about, yeah. I know you don't care about. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, do you see the new Arrow video announcement for the Blu-rays coming in December? Like, you don't want that text from me. I have text, text chains for those things. I guess it is like a fairly Daffy style of. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I'm. Yeah. I, I have nothing negative to say about it, but I, I genuinely every day I'm like, Amanda is so weird. <laughs> this is a true thing that you say very often, but like you don't think really translates. Like that other people don't really understand the depths of the weirdness. Because there's been a big mission to make me the weirdo of the show, well, which I, mean, I respect. You are. I am weird, but you are also. You know, deeply disturbed I'm buying like, nine thousand dollar like teacups. Off topic, weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, you know, you're in as my daughter would say, a phase of mom. Like you're, you're, <laughs> you, you've extended into like a mom experience where you're just like, did you see this book over here? Or did you see this story over here? Like you're just like, there's a lot of stuff like floating, <laughs> and you're just like, because when you have kids, you're like, just trying to hold it all together all the time. So when you see something that's distracting, you're like, oh my god, over here, and then you have to turn back and look at your kid. You know, you can't. It yeah. can't happen for too long an extended period of time. Um, I, I admire your style. <laughs> I think you've done great things with it. Okay, thanks so much. Um, emails? You're not really an emailer, so I don't really have a lot I of feelings am, about I that. I am past email. Yeah. That is the one thing I would say. I, it's like, I'm not really going to respond. That's kind of the thing that they don't tell you. Um, but, like, you don't really have to respond. I email a lot, but almost yeah. entirely for this show. Yeah. Publicists, screenings booking guests that's what i do um, within the first couple months of of me producing this show i remember you saying like you're a good emailer you know you know how to write an email and i'm <laughs> like what that? did you think was gonna happen <laughs> when i got here like did you think i was gonna be completely incompetent of communicating with people over email because i was some 22 people some people it's really tough yeah you're just like oh this is not gonna we're not gonna get anywhere in the text format you know we're gonna have to mm-hmm. take it to the phone or in person and that's okay. People have different strengths. Yeah. I'm just having like a like a realization wash over me as we're having this conversation because I never podcast in quite this way. Mm-hmm. Um, but my dad was in town a few months ago and we were hanging out with uh, him and my stepmom and, and my daughter. And my daughter, who's amazing, is pretty high strung. And my dad was like, yeah, she's just like you. She's really high strung. And I was like, oh, wow, you think I'm high strung. <laughs> and then I like started going through like the entire last decade of my life. I was like, wow, I'm pretty high strung. Yeah. Uh, and you don't, you can't, sometimes you can't see yourself until someone shines a light upon yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So perhaps you've been able to see yourself more clearly as I have recently as a daffy lady in the world. I mean, I guess so. I don't know. It's just sometimes, I'm, like, if, if we're going to talk, I'll just tell you what I'm thinking about. And sometimes it's a hat, I guess. Yeah, sometimes it's a, You see this hat? I what like hat? this hat. I don't, I don't know. It's a great stand-in for whatever it is you're on about. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. What's I was next? really on the fence about pulling that question in, but I'm glad I did. The next question <laughs> comes from Emily. Mm-hmm. If the entire show got stuck in an elevator together for an extended period of time, 
What do you think would happen? Um, is Chris included in this? Yeah. Why not? It's a big okay. elevator. You know? And is there air conditioning or like ventilation in the elevator? Because this is let this me is just call recent- Emily in. She's actually in my other room here at my apartment. <laughs> so this has been like a, a recent point of concern because in here at the office, just because it, it was very hot in Los Angeles recently, and the only way to get to the parking structure is through a, a elevator that is definitely. Not, like not ventilated. I mean, I don't know what the industry standards are or whatever, but it is like suffocating. Mm-hmm. And I've obviously been like quite pregnant. And so in that situation, I would be like full blown panic, like calling ambulances. Mm-hmm. If it's not that, I feel like I would just like sort of sit down and like not help and tune everybody out at some point pretty quickly. And you would go through a phase of like real anger and frustration and then quiet and then some real what's the meaning of life stuff. That's a, you nailed it. Chris would do Chris would just be doing bits. Bit I mean, work. like, yeah, honestly, sure. in, I know all I do is like pitch shows starring Chris Ryan, but like Chris Ryan's stuck places. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to figure out how to get out, but also keep the morale up. Like stuck on a funicular, stuck on a ski lift. Just and like assessing the various dangers, you know, and like what occurs to him is like how to triage the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stuck in a vestibule that Um, won't the 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 spinning door, you know, and it's him and another guy and they're in it together. That Bobby and Jack would be the fairly practical people in terms of like, have we contacted the authorities? I think that they would know that they shouldn't they should try to hold it together yeah in front of the grown-ups but i think secretly would be freaking out because nobody wants to be stuck in an elevator i wouldn't i'm just telling you right now i would not do well stuck in an elevator i don't love small spaces like that mm. oh so it's a claustrophobia situation kind of yeah okay. you know like i mean an, i'm totally valid i've been i've been very stressed out about it the last few weeks so i think I depending it. on the size of the elevator i would do all right for like up to an hour but anything beyond that i would be upset not having a good time. I think Chris would start talking about water supply really quickly. You know? Um, yeah. I think he and I both would really have to pee. So that, could, that would be I an mean, issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd prefer to not get stuck in an elevator anytime soon. Yeah. I also there. hate when technology that should function close to 100% of the time doesn't work. So I would just be going off about that. Probably try to find blame for that. Did you ever see the M. Night Shyamalan-produced film Devil? No. It's about eight people who get stuck in an elevator, and one of them is the devil. Oh, that's pretty good. Incredible. To Bobby's point, you know what I would actually do, though, while I sat down on the floor and withdrew, is I would get my phone out, and I would try to figure out, like, which corporate entities are responsible for me being stuck in an elevator, and I would fucking send some scathing. You, like, you want to know who would be back on email? It's Amanda Dobbins. (laughs) Just being like, this is the reason, you know, like, why don't you take this and put it in your PowerPoint presentation, you assholes. So that's how I would spend my time. Okay. That's an interesting question. These are, are these all social experiment questions? Is that the idea? Not all of them. Now we're okay. going to get into some movie questions and you yelled oh, at me okay. about that. So, so what do you want me to say? Uh, next question comes from Darius. If you could resurrect one screenwriter from the classic Hollywood period in his or her prime for one spec script, which one and what subject? So the idea here is that you could resurrect them in 2024, right? Not that you're transporting back to 1938. Yeah. Okay, so I what I want is Billy Wilder to write a movie about social media. That's good. That's what I think he I, is well suited to. I mean, so I'm cheating and I'm not, I mean, let's be real, like classic Hollywood, there are a lot of very talented screenwriters, but mm-hmm. unless you take Billy Wilder or Preston Sirtis, mm-hmm. you know, it, a lot of people were doing good work. So mm-hmm. I would take Sirtis as a writer or director or just bring back Howard Hawks as a director and do a comedy of remarriage about uh, Ben and J-Lo, starring Ben and J-Lo. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, we are about three days after the Polo Lounge in case anyone listening wants to follow along. Mm, where do you think they're going to be at at this point in time? I mean, I who can know? And I will tell you that 
part of the reason I would like to bring one of these these classic masters of the form back is because I felt that the polo lounge incident did not narratively make sense. And this was the first time where I was like, the writer's room has just like run out of ideas. I don't like I don't I don't get it. The kids are at a separate table. They're making out. Sounds like you don't understand passion. I do understand passion, but I don't understand why you're doing it at the polo lounge. I could psychologize it. I mean, sure, but I, you know, I would like, I would like some more rigid storytelling. Is what I'm saying. I see. Okay, well, and some banter. Well, JLo's here. JLo, come on in. We need to speak to you <laughs> about how you've been narrativizing your public breakup and makeup with Ben Affleck right now. Uh, okay, what's next? We got a question from Blake. A good one. If Amanda and Sean were on death row, what would their final meals be, and what crimes put them on death row? Really essential second part of this question. Yeah. I mean, I categorically don't believe in the death penalty, so I'll just say that right now. Okay. So Thank any any bravery. form of injustice, yeah. you know, is like... That's impressive. Are there uh, any other platforms you'd like to share? <laughs> what is your stance on Medicaid in 2024? Do you feel that our prescription drug business is... Yeah, I think everyone in the healthcare system is doing really great work, okay. especially private insurers. Okay. Um, and pharmaceuticals. Yo, I had to... Yo! <laughs> Yo! I, like, do you want to talk <laughs> about vaccines right now? Because I just had to... It's fine. I was eligible for a ex- vaccine as a pregnant woman. This was such a good idea. <laughs> this was one of my best ideas. Like, it's an actual fucking crime. I, I, I had to... Like, I had to fight tooth and nail for something which I'm medically eligible for. Uh-huh. And which... And like... Prenatal care is supposed to be guaranteed in the state of California. Mm-hmm. And 45 different people are being like, no, sorry, we don't have it. And then it was 300 bucks. It's like, that is an outrage. And I was able to do it. But like, we need vaccines for people. You know, we mm-hmm. need, it's the public health system. Everything is a fucking mess. And I blame Republicans. You're really, um, you're very brave. I'm you're you're a brave woman. You're a brave woman just putting yourself out here like that. I have no idea what you're talking about. No clue what you're talking about right now. We need <laughs> vaccines that should be free. Yeah. Don't wouldn't you like to be able to give Alice an RSV vaccine? Sure. Yeah, but it's not available to children in the United States, even though it's been widely available in Europe for some time. Uh-huh. You can get it if you're old. And we old. know they know what they're doing over there, for you sure. You can get it if you're old or <laughs> if you're between 32 and 36 weeks pregnant uh-huh. with a prescription. But then, can the doctors actually get it because the pharmaceutical companies are tying it up, of course, mm-hmm. and then only distributing it where they can make the most money. And then the insurers are only covering it under medical. It's like, it's fucked up. It's uh, this system is fucking fucked up. When you were in the running to be on <laughs> RFK Jr.'s ticket and you shared these ideas, he said what? And did I he drop out to, because of the way that I you confronted him? I don't want to take my children to the ER this winter, and I don't want you to have to go to the ER either. I don't want anyone to have to go to the ER. I, of course, I agree. Uh, what will your death row meal be? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I got so mad I forgot to think about this. Um, hmm. I mean, how many courses are we doing here? Let's just do one course. Let's just like, you're having it. All right. Okay. All right, Marie Antoinette, settle down. (laughs) 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 Just for the thing, for the sake of whatever could be perceived as brevity on this episode. Is it like, do I get a cocktail hour? Like, do I get one drink and one meal? (laughs) All right, lady, you're in the fucking brig. You're about to go to well, the chair. I don't, I don't agree with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, then sit this question out for crying out loud. Did I miss the email where brevity was the goal of this episode? <laughs> um, you know what I really like is chicken parmesan. <laughs> yep. Great answer. Great answer. You, know, you have made it for several New Year's. It's always a, it's a great tradition. I love chicken parmesan. I love to make chicken parmesan. I love to eat it. Uh, I love to go to just like a real red sauce checkerboard Italian joint and just get like a big fucking plate of chicken parmesan. I've never gotten that. I've been like, what a mistake. I'm always like, God, this fucking rocks. Now, if you put on top of that an old fashioned or gin martini, forget it. Yeah. It's a great night. That's just, that's just America to me. 
Just, just feed me invented Italian meals that were actually invented in America. Right. I mean, mine would trend similar, which is that I would have a Negroni and then probably spaghetti vongole. That's some, great. Some version of pasta. A, a seafood pasta. Yeah, get a yes. full stomach yeah. before they light you up full of lethal injection. Mm-hmm. Well, neither of you said which crimes you committed, but maybe you don't want to indict yourselves. Um, <laughs> I assassinated all the private insurers <laughs> and redistributed fucking, the Very clear that murder is the crime <laughs> that Amanda has committed. There's no question about the that. The episode... She- of JMO right before Amanda actually commits that crime is going to do 10 million downloads. <laughs> um, what's a crime I actually could credibly be seen as committing? I don't think I'm a murder guy. I'm definitely not a thief. You know, I'm a little afraid. I'm mm-hmm. a little afraid of breaking the law. It's not something I want to do. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Ponzi scheme? You can feel it when, it when a draft is going awry. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, oh, I got to start like stacking that, lies that on top of lies. That pretty stressful. That's true. And Are you're they putting you on death for a... row for a Ponzi scheme? I mean, those guys should be put to death. <laughs> well, but they're responsible yes. for like millions of people's livelihoods being taken away from them. I agree. And so should like sports owners. But, you know. Whoa, whoa. Hey, <laughs> settle down. Um, I, I, I mean, murder is the only real death row, right? You don't, I, I don't believe in death row, but I'm not asking you about that. But like maybe a political assassination. Okay. For so, I, don't, I mean, if you attempted to assassinate a, a despot mm-hmm. in a foreign country, they wouldn't put you on death row more than likely, right? That's true. You'd They'd probably rot. give you the Presidential Medal of Freedom for that. Maybe, maybe. Okay. Connor asks, who of the emerging stars of industry? will be nominated for or win the most Academy Awards? Tough one, right? It's hard. Because... To graduate. Right. There's a world where the euphoria effect happens and all of them go on to incredibly successful careers. Or there's a chance, and I say this with respect, that this is Beverly Hills 90210. And that this is what they are known for forevermore. I'm not saying it's as popular as Beverly Hills 90210. I'm not saying it's as frivolous as Beverly Hills 90210. But sometimes when a world is set so concretely in your mind, especially with young actors, it's hard to get out of that mold. What about David Johnson? Well, he's off the show. I know. Well, I that's why I was like, he, he was there. Mm-hmm. And he transitioned out before he got like fully. One of the best parts of Alien rendered. Romulus, for sure. Yeah. Wonderful in Rye Lane. Yeah, you can see him having a bigger career as an actor. But like, I don't know, Marissa Bella looks like she should be a movie star. I mean, she's got that thing that, right? you know, Mahala is the same. They both have the thing that you're like, I want to know what's going on in that person's head. You know, that's like, it's it's like you're beautiful and there's something going on behind your eyes. That's the whole story of movie stardom. And they both have that. So if they pick good parts... Marissa Bella unfortunately picked Amy Winehouse. That wasn't that wasn't great. Yeah. That didn't work out. I didn't not her didn't, fault. Didn't but... care for that. No, she was she she tried. Um, I think I think there's a world where it's Ken Lung who becomes in the second half of his career the Swiss Army knife for actors and could be nominated for Academy yeah. Awards. Unfortunately, Ken Lung is also the answer for the next industry related question, Bobby. Who who's my pick? No, uh, I was saying that Ken Lung is also the answer for the next industry re- related oh, question yeah. that you have listed here. The next question comes from Tom: Which industry character would be the best third chair on JMO? I mean, it's clearly Eric. I mean, it's not even close. I I mean, uh, who I would love to book Rishi. Sure. I think Rishi. I'm not saying I agree with his ideas, but they are provocative. Mm-hmm. Sort of feel like that one might be unpublishable here on the Ringer Podcast Network. Well, you know, these are mature conversations, you know? (laughs) And sometimes they need to be had. (laughs) That Rishi episode, man, I'm still floating off that one. That was some wild shit. That That was was like Rounders 2. I was like, this is sick. You guys just made Rounders 2 with Rishi? Amazing idea. Anyway, what's next? 
Okay, Joseph asks a very normal question. You have to watch a January 6th movie <laughs> made by one of the following directors. Which do you choose? Aaron Sorkin, Michael Bay, or Clint Eastwood? Absolutely <laughs> sick question. There's only one answer for me. For you, it's Aaron Sorkin. No, it's Michael Bay. Oh, okay. No, it's because, like, you can't trust anyone to actually try to... Like, you need the most cynical, like, boneheaded version. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? You can't have anyone, fo- like, folding in any ideals. You think it should be, like, Momoa for Keith yeah, Shaman? Like, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, you just have to... I mean, he... The thing is, is... So he made 13 Hours. Right. The Benghazi movie. Which is not his best movie. And I can feel him trying a little too hard to have something to say in that movie, even though there's nothing to say about it. And I don't know, like, to me what I like, I like when Clint is like, I understand this better than everybody. Yeah. And sometimes he's so right, like in but Sully, like, and sometimes, sometimes he's, he's so wrong. Sometimes he's talking to a chair, an empty chair. Sometimes he's talking to an Do empty chair. Do you remember chair. that? Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't great. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't love that. And I don't always love the man's politics. Yeah. Um, but again, Richard Jewell, a brave act. <laughs> he cares about journalism. He could be the third chair of the we're, press box. We're one week away from, I honestly just almost called it the rural juror. What it's, what is it <laughs> juror called? Juror number two. Sure. Juror number two. Okay. Could be good. Yeah, sure. Could be good. Um, I think I'd rather see a Michael Bay movie at this stage of my life, but I'd rather watch prime Clint Eastwood's version of the January 6th movie. I think that's Where's fair. Bay at? How Following up Ambulance? <laughs> Ambulance? Yeah. Why are you saying he that with such briefly... disdain? You said that that was a five-star masterpiece in one of the best movies of this decade. You said I that fucking on this love pod. that movie. There's no disdain. The disdain is for Hollywood that has abandoned Bay after he just created billions of dollars for this husk of a city and then they turn their back on him the minute it became convenient. How dare you, studio chiefs in Hollywood, reject one of our cinematic masters? I'm not done. Frankly, he should be given two more franchises. Transformers was not enough. Why can't Transformers and G.I. Joe, let's put them together and then bring in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and let them... (laughs) Okay, I'm done. Okay, great. Next question comes from Jonathan. Amanda, in honor of my current Parks and Rec- Parks and Recreation rewatch, what would an Amanda Dobbins Treat Yourself Day look like? Okay. So I haven't seen this Parks and Rec episode in some time. So it's like we're we're locally based, right? It's really just uh yeah, I think yeah, it has to be like, like within yeah, reason. I'm not like it's not like suddenly we're like Yeah, it's uncoffrey. not like I'm on the private jet. To yeah. Mallorca, okay. No. All right. So Los Angeles. Okay. Can I at least control the time of the year? Yeah, I would say okay. so. Okay. Okay. So it's summer, and you've got a favorable wave report for swimming in the ocean, which for me means very, very um, low to non-existent waves. Okay. Basically, I'm ch- checking the surf reports, and if they say it's poor surfing conditions, it's great swimming conditions. So you. You don't set an alarm clock. You wake up on your own time. Why, why are you looking at me like this for? It's not a hat. It's a real question that someone asked. Continue. I'm sorry that you wake up at 5 a.m. every day. I'm sorry, too. I'm deeply sorry. Um, You're going to have the coffee of your choosing at home mm-hmm. and a coffee cake. of some, I'm really passionate about coffee cake. Okay, great. Um, I think the Porto's coffee cake in Los Angeles is a really slept... I mean, Porto's is obviously not slept on, mm-hmm. but it's only 10 bucks. It's really insane. I don't like... I don't know what they're doing. It's excellent. Anyway, so hopefully someone has brought that to your home. Okay. Then you make it to the beach. Mm-hmm. And as we've discussed, it's a nice summer day and it's swimmable. So you hang out the morning in the beach. You go swimming. You want to get there before the crowds are too intense. Also, our here's our beach etiquette, everyone. We do not play loud. We don't have a speaker. We're there. We aren't listening to music. We're there to enjoy the sounds of the beach. Okay. Okay. Then we have, maybe you're, you have a book because you don't have a child, which is really nice. Or maybe you want to spend it with your child. It's up to you. Um, then you're done. And then, uh, 
All right, let's think about this. Okay, so seafood lunch. Um, depending on where you go to the beach, I like Malibu seafood. The point here is that you kind of want fried seafood and French fries, you know, and tartar sauce. Don't give me your macro stuff, Bobby. Um, then you're going to find your way home. You're going to take a nap. That's really important. Then you're going to wake up and you're going to make it to <laughs> what I was asked. Mm-hmm. Continue. <laughs> 5 p.m. movie of your choice. I think this podcast is being released on the day that Conclave is released. That's right. And I have to tell you, I'm so excited to just go to the Conclave as a civilian and just like watch like a highbrow dumb movie. Did you, you know? already go as a defense contractor? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just going to show up. I'm going to be like, this is like definitely taken from an airport novel, but it's fancy actors and fancy clothes. And I can't wait. Um, and then dinner at your local Houston's. And you got to get the artichoke dip. What you want for the entrees up to you. I, I mean, I can never not get the chicken sandwich. So this is kind of tough. You like Houston's. Don't look at me like this. I'm not judging you at all. Um, what I've done is clear out. And then go home and get a good night's sleep. Here it is. America, <laughs> everybody. That's conspicuous consumption. That's what it'll get you. What? What do you want me to say? Um, my uh, treat yourself day no one asks. is it I says want just Amanda Dobbins. A giant fish bowl the size of my head full of Sour Patch Kids. And I want to smoke a fat blunt at 9 a.m. in the morning and just sit on my couch and watch horror movies. That's it. That's the only thing I want. And I probably won't be able to do that until like 2047 based on how my life is going recently. But when I get to that day, it shall be a great day. Mm -hmm. I shall be finally at peace. I probably left out some like idle online shopping that you do on your phone, if we're being very honest. Maybe during the trailers for the movie. Okay. Thanks for filling in on that. (laughs) A hat. I like this hat. I don't know. It's like maybe this is the day that you buy that weird hand cream of Instagram, you know? Maybe. And you keep it at like a pump by the side every day. (laughs) And then it has retinol in it. Do you know about retinol? (laughs) (laughs) It's weird how I was sent to hell in the middle of my life. (laughs) After committing no sins. (laughs) They were like, it's time to go to hell. Do you know what retinol is? Retinol? Yeah. Nope. I know what retcon is, <laughs> okay, and I know no. what hypnol is. Ret, like, you know, vitamin and like none of the 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 face things. I mean, it's good. You're that- being very expressive. <laughs> Definitely understand what you mean. Um, it's like it's a, a not really. I mean, it can be delivered in many different forms. It's a skincare ingredient that re- uh, stimulates rapid cell skin cell turnover. So it's an anti-aging. I, I can't thing. believe you still haven't seen the substance. <laughs> <laughs> You just explained the substance to me. Yeah. I mean, this is actually going to be the thing. Like, what if I walk walk out and I'm just like, yeah, about the substance. I think it's in play. I know. I mean, it's definitely speaking to ideas you're interested in. It's just the execution is what I'm concerned about. Yeah. But so you can't use retinol every day and you exfoliate every day. So I don't want to introduce retinol into your life. Mm, Okay. You got to build up tolerance over time. But you can't use it when you're pregnant or when you're nursing. So I'm off it right now. But I'm excited. Got it. I can't use the hand cream either. But maybe on Treat Yourself Day. Definitely. I'll be sure to make that day happen for you as soon as I can. Um, <laughs> what's next? Are you guys, do you guys want to do this next question about child rearing? Sure. He's, he's in a great emotional space. Pizza Dad is back. Pizza Dad has another question here. As the parent of a toddler, I often wonder. Wait, hold on a second. Is this man a, a father of pizza? <laughs> is it as an individual pie? Um, I have the, the Federal the Bureau of, of Investigation pizza? looking into <laughs> Wait, the nature of Pizza Dad. Speaking of parenting, sorry, I just got to read the, the whatever. I just got a text from Zach. Knox has requested that Mirna Arnani take him to a police station. <laughs> <laughs> just a little sneak preview. Things to come. This is not good, but that's an incredible text <laughs> message. Wow. Copaganda from the two-year-old. Incredible. <laughs> it's hard because it's like, we're really trying, you know, and there's like the book about jobs that he loves. And we're like, yeah, fi- you know, fireman, firewoman, great stuff. And then he's like, police officer. And you're just like, Rrr. but it didn't work. Um, 
have some thoughts about it yeah. for him when he comes of Sorry. age. That's an incredible text message. You don't know why he wants podcast. to go there. He didn't say he could want to rebel ridge it. That's true. It's true. You're right. It's true. In general, we haven't gotten a lot of responses to the question why from him. So you're you're right. We don't know. Nonviolent disarmament. That's yeah. what his interests are. Exactly. Yeah. He's like the Batman of two and a half year olds in the <laughs> Los Angeles area. Okay. Pizza okay. Dad's question. As the parent of a toddler, I often wonder, what did you two find as the most difficult part of child rearing? For me, it's sleep deprivation. So I, I am in a phase, and if the show has just been weird this fall, I'm really <laughs> sorry, but like I am in a phase where I'm just not getting any sleep because of child rearing. This is really the first time this has come up since she was three months old. Yeah. And I do find that really challenging, but more so what I find challenging, and I think that a lot of, probably a lot of dads will relate to this, maybe moms too, is the complete lack of logic. Is that there's no way to rationally get through anything. So if your child is upset about something or if you can't quite figure out what's going on with something or if you're just trying to get information from your kid, from right. your young kid, the inability to do it the way you would with any other person in the world, I find really challenging. Yeah. Because I am, as you noted about my plane activities and elsewhere, like I am a very like forward moving, clear stated kind of person. And if yeah. I can't get that clarity, and it's it's in direct contrast to the joy that hanging out with my kid provides. Right. Because when it's taken away, it's like you've just, she just can turn the tables like nobody else. You know, she really can just be like, you thought this was a good time? You're wrong. Here's why. It's amazing how fast it happens. Yeah. 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 So I think at first I was going to agree with Pizza Dad. Yeah. And thank you for all your work, Pizza Dad. Um, but it's not just the sleep thing. It's more like, why is this the way that it is? And I'll never know. Well, there is no, I mean, they are irrational human beings. Like sometimes they're actually like, is no logic and they are often working like against their own best interest or logic in general. Sometimes literally. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I, I mean, sleep de deprivation, I'm, I'm sure by the time this goes out, I mean, some amazing voice memos are coming your guys' way from my sleep deprivation, but like the, more broadly, the physicality. Mm, yeah. And like, yeah. obviously. We're a little older. I wonder if we were 28, if it would be different. Yeah. And I, I guess also a little bit is like, I have a, just an incredibly active little kid, even on like the span, I'm, you know, all little kids don't sit still, but Knox is like the energizer bunny. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I remember the first six months being like, just very taken aback by like the repetitive motion of like leaning over and picking up and all those sorts of things and then trying to keep up with them. And also, you know, when they're up, they're up. So you're also just on yep. all of the time. So that. I have a lot of respect and confusion as to people who have two, three, four, five kids. I'm like, I genuinely, yeah, I mean, genuinely don't know it's how. It's going to be really, really interesting. Yeah. I, how it's we. Alarming that people do um, that. I'm excited about it. The other thing, and this is smaller, and it's like, I was, I was talking with Jack about this ahead of time. I mean, in general, one of the most difficult parts is like how fucking expensive everything is. Yes. And I mean, it's it's just, it is so expensive. Um, yes. But. Um, Especially in a big city. I mean, it is, LA I is very anywhere. Yeah. And like, you know, not to get back on my health care thing, but like there's not enough support for like everybody and all of all of that stuff. It's like genuinely very hard. But um, this morning I was just like, Knox needs new pajamas. The baby needs some pajamas. Like, do you guys know how much baby pajamas cost? Like, Bobby, how much do you think a pair? Like, one pair of pajamas for Knox costs. Well, I I overheard what you were talking about earlier. So oh, so I, you heard it. Okay. Like 40 bucks. Like, what are we doing? Well, you're buying nice shit. No, not even. Like, I'm buying, like, the mid-tier. Like, I, I mean, that's true. You're not buying Louis can... Vuitton, but you're buying nicer than I got this at Safeway. You know what I mean? Sure. You're not going to TJ Maxx. But you're not. I honestly, but you're not we, going do, to we actually do wear a lot of Target pajamas, and they're okay. good, and they can yeah. be like twenty bucks. But even Target but is I nicer feel... than like Walmart. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, and that's true. But I also like feel this way about adult underwear. I'm like, how? Why does underwear cost this much? You know, I just like I've been on that Uniqlo train for a long time. I mean, how? But so, how much does a pair of Uniqlo underwear cost? It's like five for thirty, something like that. Five for forty. Okay, so that's six dollars. Five to six dollars a pair. Good. Pretty good deal. Okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. 
I guess women. And they last. I'm paying like $12. But that's a lot. I just, yeah. I don't know. Things cost a lot. Can't argue with that. You're, it's, it's insanely expensive. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, it's been eye opening how expensive it is. Um, and you know what? It's all set up for you guys in Gen Z, Bob. Yeah. Congratulations. You know, we left, we've, we left it better than we found yeah, it. Yeah. It's so, all, it's going to be fine. For uh, who, who in Gen Z? Are we talking about? We're talking about Jack. Oh, right. <laughs> no, Gen Z, your generation, the generation that you have represented as not, the avatar. Not of the familiar show with their work. But Jack is Gen Alpha. I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you got mad when I said that. You guys both are so touchy about this. Okay, what's next? Um, next question comes from Jason. If you have a suboptimal real-world interaction with a filmmaker, does it negatively impact the way you view their work going forward? Or are you able to divorce yourself from the interaction and experience their art on its own terms? Um, I... Can't, genuinely have not had a lot of negative real world interactions with filmmakers. I have had unpleasant experiences on mic where people, I think I've, I won't name any names, but some filmmakers have just been rude or weird when they've come on the show, mm -hmm. which I, I know is like kind of funny actually that some people <laughs> will just come on and be like, I remember David Kep in particular, who is a screenwriter. I really, really like, and he directed a movie, um, a horror film with Kevin Bacon and Amanda Seyfried that came out during COVID. And he came on the show and he's as accomplished as they come in terms of Hollywood screenwriters. But I could, I don't know if he had heard the show before or he just didn't like the cut of my jib or whatever, but he was just like, you know, you're not hot, the hot shit you think you are basically in the <laughs> conversation. And I sensed that. And he wasn't like directly aggressive, but he was kind of like, oh yeah? Oh yeah? To stuff I would say. And I think that's funny, mm -hmm. but I will never invite David Kep back on the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's no upside to having that conversation again. And I like, he, like he's writing the UFO Steven Spielberg movie. I'll probably love it. Right. You know, like, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not going to carry that with me in my evaluation of his work for the rest of time. But on the show, I was like, this is a weird posture to take during COVID when I'm talking about your small Blumhouse movie, David Kep. Like, there's no reason. I'm pretty nice to the filmmakers yeah. in, in the interview section. It's not like when I'm talking to you and I'm just being a rude dick. Like, right. I'm pretty, pretty convivial. But you're, but you're more assessing it on just like a social experiment, social experience than an artistic level. Yeah. And I like, I think it's a weird choice and a weird business choice. You're right. If you, yeah, I, and this isn't, this is not a, Unless it's I, maybe he listened to us and was like, "Oh, this is a throwdown podcast," so that's what I'm supposed to it's do. Entirely possible. I really don't think that he did. I hope he has better things to do with his life. But I, it was it was COVID, you know. Well, he could have could have had the spare time. I, do you remember this, Bobby? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? I don't recall that specific interview. I definitely relate to some interviews being markedly different feeling of yeah. people not really being down to just vibe out for 35 minutes. And a few yes. come to mind that I will not name, but I, I I think for the most part, like, I don't know. I don't find myself in spaces where a filmmaker could or would even be a dick to me. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not a lot of opportunities for you to have an interaction that's long enough to even decide whether or not it was negative enough to change your opinion of their art. So, I don't know. This question, I mean, it's a good question, but. Yeah. I mean, I think I've had opportunities to be a lot closer to, more proximate to people like this just in like the film festival world where mm -hmm. you're kind of bunched together and so you're interacting with people that who don't know who you are or you don't know who they are at certain times but um this is gonna sound Pollyannish but like most people are pretty nice like nobody is like very few people like at a film festival like get out of my way I'm a big fucking deal like that's kind of that era is over and if you are a person that is like that you're usually surrounded by 10 people right. and you'd never be allowed to have an interaction like that there are some exceptions of course but for the most part, when I read the question, I was like, I, th I thought more of what you were saying, the like four to five people who've come on the pod and just been dicks. I'm like, why are you here? Like, just don't do this. It's okay. You can skip it. Um, but I don't know. Maybe people have bad days. Who knows? Yeah. You don't want to reveal that actually like Alex Ross Perry is the worst hang of all time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the best part about the show is getting to meet people like Alex and then become friends with them. I mean, I, I, I love that. Like The best part of the interviewing, like getting to know people that are interested in movies and care about movies as much as I do. Right. That that's awesome. Alex knows everything about movies. He's he's a genius. So that 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 stuff's been great. But he also can be kind of a dick in a fun way. That's the that's the trick. 
Can you be a dick in a fun way? Not easy to pull off. This is true. Uh, we got a question here from Frankie. What is the last film that made you cry? Alternately, what is the film that made you cry the most? I forgot to prepare for this. Do you have an answer? Yeah. The, well, the last movie that made me cry was uh, when we were doing the Steve Martin episode. Um, I I was, in fact, pregnant, and I allowed myself to rewatch the Steve Martin Father of the Bride, and I think that should be a, a legally banned substance when you're pregnant. Um and then I mean it's it's a one it's a wonderful film but uh, uh, things got out of hand shall we say and then honestly the film that has made me cry the most in my life uh, is one I saw Armageddon when I was 15 years old <laughs> um, I just like that that is actually factually true I was 15 years old and I watched it and I like didn't recover for several days um, that's very funny well. I guess, like, I, I don't know. I don't know what my answer would be for the made you cry the most. I definitely, I got really choked up at movies like The Lion King, you know, when I was eleven, mm -hmm. and I was like, they they did Mufasa like that. Yeah, this is outrageous. You know, like I didn't know that they could take him away. Right. Uh, Meanwhile, your daughter's like, I don't care. Good riddance. No, she's like, <laughs> Scar is the man. <laughs> <laughs> an incredible take from her. She rules. Um, the movie this year that made me cry? I don't think there have been any new releases that made me mm. really... Horizon and American Saga Chapter 1? I was sobbing throughout the whole final act, <laughs> which is actually still kind of like a prequel. I don't know. <laughs> the complete incomprehensibility of it had me in tears. So what happened with the Venice screening of Part 2? I never saw any footage from that. He uh, was doing some interviews, but I never heard any like reviews. Was it not I. screened for the press? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I liked how he very solemnly was like, "I believe I will complete chapters three and four. Mm -hmm. But everybody in the room is like, "Sir, you won't." It's tough. It's really tough. Love Kevin Costner. Um. Is there a single movie this year that really had me? I mean, Sing Sing got me. I don't know if I was crying. Yeah, but I was definitely emotionally affected. Yeah. Hundreds of Beavers? <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really find anything this year. Something will come along. The film that made me cry the most, like, without a doubt, not even close, is Coco. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. sort of your Lion King. Yeah. Well, I also had The Lion King. Like, I cried when I was, you know, five when I saw The Lion King or whatever. But I didn't see Coco until I was, like, I don't know, mem memorably an adult. Like, I worked at The Ringer when I saw that for the first time. Really? Yeah. And that got you good? Oh, it got me really good. Jack was nodding as well when you said that. Okay. Coco's a great movie. I feel like it's too early to show that to my kid. It's, I... it's devastating. Absolutely devastating. And also, like, maybe a little scary for her. You know, with all that's the what I was people. thinking. It's a little complex ideas of death. That's a it's a long conversation. Although, who knows? You know, she's on Team Scar, so maybe she's already thinking about it. You know, what has been hard as explaining Halloween ideas to her. Yeah, I also Knox is not really getting the like both the concept of I could be this person for like one night only. Oh, uh, but then I meant more like how do you explain what a mummy is, and then you have to go into like ancient Egyptian. Burial practices. Oh, I'm like, but I, I thought I'm she was. Well I thought she was this. really into mummies because when we went to the Halloween show, there were no mummies, and that was much like when we went to the Living Desert, and there were no monkeys. And so Alice was just like thumbs down. Yes, she's taken to calling the cat that performed at the puppet show the cat mummy, even though there was no mummy component. Oh, okay. Well, listen, as long as that's what she wanted. Kid loves mummies and Scar. I don't. I don't know what to say. She's a very interesting person. <laughs> Future B movie <laughs> film director. <laughs> Those are bones. <laughs> Just one of the funniest things Alice has ever said in her entire life about we, some what were they ja like hyenas yeah, eating we, a bunch we, of bones. We went to a uh, in Palm Springs, the Living Desert, which is kind of like an open air zoo, you know, like a m more of open terrain zoo, and um, there were hyenas, and the man came around to feed the hyenas, and he threw like 
ground lamb into the cage, you know, like just meat. And because Alice thinks that hyenas are dogs, she was like, those are bones. Like there were their dog bones that the dogs were getting. Um, she was two when she said this. Weird kid. I uh, love her. Okay. What's next? Uh, Joel or Joel. I apologize. Joel or Joel. Any update on Sean's custom garage shelving conundrum? Mm. I believe last time we had a mailbag, or last time we did an episode with Tim, you talked about how you were running out of space or something of that sort. I ran out of space. So we're double stacking right now, which is just horrifying to me. I mean, like, really, nothing could be more painful. Okay. But I don't have enough room. So uh, we're going to tear down my house. We're going (laughs) to rebuild it. And um, we're just going to make an entire... The house, the whole whole house, can be a shelving unit, so I can fit all my the media. house. You haven't been over in a little while, I but we've we, done some renovating. Well, it's not some soft renovating. Some really like rearranging because okay. we had to make room for the baby, which involved uh, asking my husband to confront the the many boxes of junk or beloved t shirts, depending on your point of view. <laughs> hiding in various rooms in our home and then for both of us to confront all our books which is my version of your DVDs Mm -hmm. and we like we have added a lot of shelving and I think we found some nice options oh yeah so maybe off mic you can share yeah um I don't I don't even know if the guy who does my custom stuff is still in business but I don't really have any space like literally there's no open space on the walls right so that's the thing is that what am I gonna do I don't live in a very big house. We tried to call the books, and then I think we went between us wound up picking like twelve to get rid of. You know, we we it's our own disease. But I'm with you. It's okay to like physical possessions. That's okay. It means you have made a connection with the art. I re you know I use the library. I reread the things. It's great. Thank you so much. I love books. What's next, Robert? Lucy, tough one here. Would you mm-hmm. rather never be able to watch a new movie ever again or never be able to listen to new music ever again and why? This is not tough because we're we're 40 and over. So no new music. This is going to come up again in the next yeah. uh, question. But um, does this include podcasts? I don't think so. It's easily I would. I need movies. I need movies. Yeah, same. We have we have a robust uh 2000 year history of music to fall back on. This is true, but we have, I feel though, I feel as though I am further behind on movies, the back catalog of movies, than I am on the back catalog of music. Do you know what I mean? I tend to agree, but I've also staked a significant portion of my livelihood on being able to podcast about new movies. So, uh, oh, that's true. Yeah. Not when you switch to every single album, Sabrina Carpenter. (laughs) Do you think Nora would invite me on to every single album? I think she would love to have you. Okay. We'll see. She's not listening, so it's okay. Uh it's gotta be it's gotta be gotta be movies yeah. here. New music. I don't I know. don't I mean, I I liked the Charlie album and I appreciate the work of Sabrina Carpenter and Chapel Roan. But it's fine. Yeah, you know. It's fine. <laughs> you know. What's next, Bob? Matt asks, Sean and Amanda, what are your three favorite cocktails? Matt would like you to leave out Negronis. I know. I saw that. I already tipped my hand here. Yeah. Riled fashioned. Yeah. Whistle Pig would be nice if they got it. Uh, gin Martini. Mm-hmm. Hendrix. Mm-hmm. With a twist. Mm-hmm. What about just an old-fashioned margarita? Margarita is my number one once Negronis are off the table. And I'm like, I'm at the phase of pregnancy where it's like, you're going to drive me from the hospital to like Chili's happy hour and I will get the margarita the size of my head. You know, like mm-hmm. it needs to be in a glass that big. Um, did you have a, did you have a hospital margarita? So I had a Eileen hospital. and I were talking about I this. had a hospital margarita kit. Okay. Ruthie. <laughs> Ruthie Bear and my wonderful sister-in-law, because this, like, this also happened last pregnancy, like, at some point, and there was, like, a Mexican restaurant in our neighborhood that I would walk by all the time, like, with the happy hour, you know, and the giant things, and I was like, that's all I want. So, Ruthie got me a margarita kit to take to the hospital with, um, she supplied tequila, the salt for the rim, mm-hmm. 
And like, honestly, a really good lime squeezer that we were, um, that now we just use all the, it's like the best citrus squeezer. Okay. And then I think Zach was supposed to supply the limes. Uh, I didn't actually end up making the margarita in the hospital. Okay. But I did like very soon after Knox. Like once we figured out the schedule, like I had that 5 p.m. margarita within a couple weeks and it was really very exciting. So margarita is number one for me. Two? I'm looking forward to it. Um, Is it cheat? It's Boulevardier. <laughs> Okay. Well, sorry. Just trying to get Winter that Campari season. money. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I really am trying to get that Campari money. I, know, I get it. They sponsor film festivals and they could also sponsor me. I am like absolutely mm -hmm. the number one fan. You've proven yourself in this discussion to be eminently sponsorable. Um, I I think I am. Yeah. Definitely. But that's okay. Definitely. Uh, You're going to get to go to so many. I want, are they a sponsor of New York Film Festival this I'm year? I'm not sure. That was a great party. Um, okay, then number three. I, I'm not really a martini person. And aside from like a Boulevardier with the Campari to cancel, I'm not like a huge brown liquor person. Mm -hmm. So. Kind of like a vodka tonic. I mean, that that's sort of like a. What about a Caipirinha? I, sure, but I, I was going to go more towards like an Aperol Spritz okay. situation. Okay. Is Just that a festive. cocktail? I mean, it has liquor in it. Yeah, Aperol is so light. I don't know. Bobby, verdict? Would you like... Does that qualify? Aperol Spritz? I think a cocktail technically has to have three ingredients. So if you add the soda water, three I suppose it counts. Three alcoholic ingredients or three ingredients? What's that? Three alcoholic ingredients or three ingredients? Fine, French seventy five. What's up? Um, I think is that gin, champagne, and and lemon. It's okay. a New Orleans thing. Oh. And when Zach and I went to New Orleans, we went to the place where they make the French seventy fives, and they're very good. And cool. he makes them every I once in a while. That. Great, yeah, great recommendation. Okay, Wags, let's do like two or three more. Sounds good. Do you have any that you? No, just 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 spin spin the wheel. Whatever you whatever you want to hear. Uh, well, we got a great question here from Bong Legs. Thank you, Bong Legs. Who Bong get, Legs. Who gets strokes when Cr and Sean play golf? <laughs> the people need to know. <laughs> so, can you explain what that means? Um, yeah, I mean, when when you golf, there are people who have varying levels of skill, mm -hmm. and in order to make when we play, for example, when I play with your husband and. Maybe Jeff Chow or yeah, yeah, yeah. Dan Riley or any number of our friends we play with on a regular basis. Some of us are better than others. And so to have games where two people play against another twosome, you've got to have strokes to account for the differentiation in skill. I would say I don't ever get strokes. That's what I'll say. Okay. I'm not, I don't get, it doesn't mean I'm the best player because I'm not. But I am, I would say I am the absolute median. I am like the mean, the average player. I'm the kind of person who shoots like 91 on a golf course. Mm -hmm. And I have like three really cool shots, three of the worst shots you've ever seen in your life. And then everything else is fine. Do you, when you play with my friends, Katie and Becky, who are like my best friends and the best golfers yes. that I personally know. Yes. Do you get strokes? Because they're better than you. They definitively are better yeah. than me. No question about it. Um, I don't they think so. They won't listen so. to this. I don't think so. Hear that, but, but in fairness, we play from different tees. Oh, okay. All right. So I think given that, that kind okay. of. Okay, fair enough. That accounts for it. I don't, I don't. Chris, I don't want to say. Chris can say what it, Chris can talk about his golf game on his podcast. I try not to know anything about what happens when they play golf. So I'm not really able to answer this except to say, like, what I know about is when you guys almost get into a fight with other people on the golf course. Yeah. I think so, a lot of this is very overstated. It's happened like three um, times. One time it, it actually almost really happened. The other two times it wasn't real. Um, I'm a normal man with normal feelings, and that's it. What's next? All right, we got a wacky one here. This one comes from Brian. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? I need you to read that again. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck 
or 100 duck-sized horses? I mean, this is, no, this is really hard. No, it's so easy. We have a long history on this show of maybe ducks talking crazy about fighting mean. animals. Ducks are mean. They are birds. They're such flawed creatures. What are they going to do? They don't have fucking hands. What are you going to do to me, duck? Give me a horse-sized duck eight days a week. I'll fucking knock his teeth out. I'll knock that bill right off. What are you going to do? You're a duck. You're going to flap your wings at me? No. Fuck that duck. (laughs) I'm taking that duck down a peg. I mean, I know, like, I like I'm in like really treacherous territory here on like a number of levels because I'm still living down the kangaroo incident. Right, right um, exactly. Yeah, you were like, I can knock that kangaroo out. <laughs> I know, and I didn't really. I, and then everybody I, was like, they're fierce beasts. They're, apparently, they're killers. Yeah, but protecting fucking, their joey. But so are ducks. Okay. Uh, listen, I don't want to encounter any bird in the wild ever. And we've been really clear about this. And we talked about the peacocks and you sent me an Instagram about just like a peacock. There were wild peacocks in our neighborhood for many years. I think mm-hmm. they've migrated slightly yeah. south, They're which harmless. I feel good about. Yeah, okay. Listen, the, fuck that. And they're <laughs> just, they're like, they're gross turkeys. And then they're trying to spread the things that you, I really, I really, 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 really don't like interacting with birds. So there's that. And then it's giant sized. And so you do have to wonder in that case, like, does the super sizing affect its balance and general biological structure? Yeah. And does that make it more or less powerful? I'll just slash the ankles of that giant duck. Then what are you going to do, duck? I do I, think that's, that's the right answer. Well, I thought you said duck. I, I mean, it, it probably like is one duck because like horses are also powerful and a hundred of them. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I met some like mini donkeys recently and like that was also an alarming experience. Anytime something is smaller than it should be, <laughs> it's a real, it is but challenging. Like, but they were like so mean, you know, and and I was like, and there's only four of them. Do you think it was because of the so, audience or what, what was the issue? So a hundred, even if like they're this big, you know, and horses are smart. Um, I think so. Okay. Yeah, they're regal, noble creatures. You would know the answer to this if you had watched Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, which you so disrespectfully disregarded. So I guess I have to pick... Trying to score points with Gen Z again over here. I have to pick it's the not- giant <laughs> duck, but like I, I like, I don't feel good about this. So you, you're going with uh, one, one giant hun- duck. No, you're- I'm going with one giant duck, yeah. but I'm scared. Get out of here, duck! Get that duck out of here. I literally I can't do better more. than that. That's it. There's you. I, there's not a better question than that to end on. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, as usual, I'm really good at making up ideas for this show. I just feel like this is some of our best work. Probably the last episode you'll ever hear of this show. <laughs> we'll have the Duck Bureau after us. Um, any closing what thoughts? What do you feel like you... What are your takeaways from this podcast? What did you learn? I've wasted my life. <laughs> I've created a mountain of nonsense and I scale it every day. Okay. Um, no, I, I, I feel good. feel like we got a good thing going. I'm going to miss you. <laughs> you know, I think, think it's all going well. I, know, I will text you daily. No, no, but all right, it's okay. I'll, I'll miss this. <laughs> yeah. But it'll be back. I will too. I, I tell you, wherever you are in the world right now. Hey, we had one question that we didn't get to and it's fine because I didn't have that many answers. But people asked for fall recommendations. And if you're somewhere right now where you can get an apple cider donut, mm. can you drive somewhere and get one and just like think of me? You know? Why won't you be able to have any? Well, LA is not sourcing up the apple cider donuts properly. I, I legitimately mm. thought about being like, because you will be in New York in October. And yeah. I'm like, can you bring me home some apple cider donuts? I don't think those are going to keep. Right. And I, you know, there were several issues, yeah. including like, would you actually do it? And the answer is like, probably not. But I'll put it in the mail for you. Yeah, but then by the time they get here, you yeah. know, I you mean, need like the mail. out of the yeah. fryer experience. Yeah. I'll send it anyway, on that duck when I kick his ass. What I'm doing right now in this moment while you guys are listening to the podcast is not as fun as eating a donut or fighting a duck. So figure out one of those two things. And what was that duck thinking? <laughs> that he could come into my house? <laughs>
<laughs> and try to take what's mine. Here's the thing is that the duck <laughs> is like center of gravity is so like bottom forward. All he has to do is like one shot at your knees and you are fucking out. Yeah. Like you are down instantly. Yeah, let's see him try. And then he just pecks you to death. No, not in this tower of pain. Yeah. You can't touch me, duck, you fucking animal. You're going to fold. Okay. Uh, my laptops are running out of juice. I'd like to thank Jack Sanders for his work on this episode. I'd like to thank Bobby Wagner, who's the producer of this, uh, the final episode of this podcast. The big picture. <laughs> thank you to the listeners. Um, well, we're inching ever closer to the election. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you soon.